never could comprehend how Mr. Weston could part with him. To give up. One's child. I really never could think well of anybody who proposed such a thing to anybody else. Nobody ever did think well of the Churchills, I fancy observed Mr. John. Nightly coolly. But you need not imagine Mr. Weston to have felt what you would feel in giving up Henry or John. Mr. Weston is rather an easy, cheerful, tempered man than a man of strong feelings, he takes things as he finds them and makes enjoyment of them somehow or other, depending, I suspect, much more upon what is called society for his comforts, that is, upon the power of eating and drinking and playing whist with his neighbours five times a week than upon family affection, or anything that home affords. Emma could not like what bordered on a reflection on Mr. Weston, and had half a mind to take it up, but she struggled, and let it pass. She would keep, though, peace if possible, and there was something honourable and valuable in the strong domestic habits, the all-sufficiency of home to himself, whence resulted her brother's disposition to look down on the common rate of social intercourse, and those to whom it was important dot, it had a high claim to forbearance. Chapter 12 Mr Knightley was to dine with them, rather against the inclination of Mr Woodhouse, who did not like that any one should share with him in Isabella's first day. Emma's sense of right however had decided it, and besides though, consideration of what was due to each brother, she had particular pleasure. From the circumstance of the late disagreement between Mr Knightley and herself, in procuring him the proper invitation, she hoped they might now become friends again. She thought it was time to make up. Making up indeed would not do. She certainly had not been in the wrong, and he would never own that he had. Concession must be out of the question, but it was time to appear to forget that they had ever quarrelled, and she hoped it might rather assist the restoration of friendship, that when he came into the room she had one of the children with her, the youngest, a nice little girl about eight months old, who was now making her first visit to Hartfield, and very happy to be danced about in her aunt's arms. It did assist. For though he began with grave looks and short questions, he was soon led on to talk of them all in the usual way and to take the child out of her arms with all the unceremoniousness of perfect amity. Emma felt they were friends. Again, and the conviction giving her at first great satisfaction, and then a little sauciness, she could not help saying, as he was admiring the baby. What a comfort it is, that we think alike about our nephews and nieces. As to men and women, our opinions are sometimes very different, but with regard to these children, I observe we never disagree. If you were as much guided by nature in your estimate of men and women, and as little under the power of fancy and whim in your dealings with them, as you are where these children are concerned, we might always think alike. To be sure, our discordances must always arise from my being in the wrong. Yes, said he, smiling, and reason good. I was sixteen years old when you were born. A material difference then, she replied, and no doubt you were much. My superior in judgment at that period of our lives, but does not the lapse of one and twenty years bring our understandings a good deal nearer. Yes, a good deal nearer. But still, not near enough to give me a chance of being right, if we think. Differently. I have still the advantage of you by sixteen years' experience, and by not. Being a pretty young woman and a spoiled child. Come, my dear Emma, let us. Be friends, and say no more about it. Tell your aunt, little Emma, that she ought to set you a better example than to be renewing old grievances, and that.
If she were not wrong before, she is now. That's true, she cried, very true. Little Emma, grow up a better woman than your aunt. Be infinitely cleverer and not half so conceited. Now, Mr. Knightley, a word or two more, and I have done. As far as good intentions went, we were both right, and I must say that no effects on my side of the argument have yet proved wrong. I only want to know that Mr. Martin is not very, very bitterly disappointed. A man cannot be more so was his short, full answer. Ah. Indeed I am very sorry. Dot, come, shake hands with me. This had just taken place and with great cordiality, when John Knightley made his appearance, and how do ye do, George? And John, how are you? Succeeded in the true English style, burying under a calmness that seemed all but indifference, the real attachment which would have led either of them, if requisite, to do everything for the good of the other. The evening was quiet and conversable, as Mr. Woodhouse declined cards. Entirely for the sake of comfortable talk with his dear Isabella, and the little party made two natural divisions, on one side he and his daughter, on the other. The two Mr. Knightleys, their subjects totally distinct, or very rarely mixing, and Emma only occasionally joining in one or the other. The brothers talked of their own concerns and pursuits, but principally of those of the elder, whose temper was by much the most communicative, and who was always the greater talker. As a magistrate, he had generally some point of law to consult John about, or, at least, some curious anecdote to give. And as a farmer, as keeping in hand the home farm at Donewall, he had to tell what every field was to bear next year, and to give all such local information, as could not fail of being interesting to a brother whose home it had equally been the longest part of his life, and whose attachments were strong. The plan of a drain, the change of a fence, the felling of a tree, and the destination of every acre for wheat, turnips, or spring corn, was entered into with as much equality of interest by John, as his cooler manners rendered possible, and if his willing brother ever left him anything to inquire about, his inquiries even approached a tone of eagerness. While they were thus comfortably occupied, Mr. Woodhouse was enjoying a full flow of happy regrets and fearful affection with his daughter. My poor dear Isabella said he, fondly taking her hand, and interrupting for a few moments, her busy labours for some one of her five children, how long it is, how terribly long since you were here, and how tired you must be after your journey. You must go to bed early, my dear, and I recommend a little gruel to you before you go. Dot, you and I will have a nice basin of gruel together. My dear Emma, suppose we all have a little gruel. Emma could not suppose any such thing, knowing as she did, that both though. Mr. Knightley's were as unpersuadable on that article as herself, and two basins only were ordered. After a little more discourse in praise of Gruel, with some wondering at its not being taken every evening by everybody, he proceeded to say, with an air of grave reflection, It was an awkward business, my dear, you're spending the autumn at South. And instead of coming here, I never had much opinion of the sea air. Mr. Wingfield most strenuously recommended it, sir, or we should not have gone. He recommended it for all the children, but particularly for the weakness in little Bella's throat, both sea air and bathing. Ah, my dear, but Perry had many doubts about the sea doing her any good, and as to myself, I have been long perfectly convinced, though perhaps I never told you so before, that the sea is very rarely of use to anybody. I am Sure it almost killed me once.
Come, come, cried Emma, feeling this to be an unsafe subject, I must beg you not to talk of the sea. It makes me envious and miserable, I who have never seen it. South End is prohibited, if you please. My dear Isabella, I have not heard you make one inquiry about Mr. Perry yet, and he never forgets. You? Oh. Good Mr. Perry, how is he, sir? Why, pretty well, but not quite well. Poor Perry is bilious, and he has not time to take care of himself, he tells me he has not time to take care of himself, which is very sad, but he is always wanted all round the country. I suppose there is not a man in such practice anywhere. But then there is not so clever a man anywhere. And Mrs. Perry and the children, how are they? Do the children grow? I have a great regard for Mr. Perry. I hope he will be calling soon. He will be so pleased to see my little ones. I hope he will be here tomorrow, for I have a question or two to ask him about myself of some consequence. And, my dear, whenever he comes, you had better let him look at little Bella's throat. Oh, my dear sir, her throat is so much better that I have hardly any uneasiness about it. Either bathing has been of the greatest service to her, or else it is to be attributed to an excellent imbrication of Mr. Wingfield's, which we have been applying at times ever since August. It is not very likely, my dear, that bathing should have been of use to her. And if I had known you were wanting an imbrication, I would have spoken. Two. You seem to me to have forgotten Mrs. and Miss Bates, said Emma. I have not heard one inquiry after them. Oh, the good Bateses, I am quite ashamed of myself, but you mention them in most of your letters. I hope they are quite well. Good old Mrs. Bates. I will call upon her tomorrow and take my children. Dot. They are always so. Pleased to see my children, Dot, and that excellent Miss Bates. Such thorough, worthy people. How are they, sir? Why, pretty well, my dear, upon the whole. But poor Mrs. Bates had a bad cold about a month ago. How sorry I am. But colds were never so prevalent as they have been this autumn. Mr. Wingfield told me that he has never known them more general or heavy, except when it has been quite an influenza. That has been a good deal the case, my dear, but not to the degree you mention. Perry says that colds have been very general, but not so heavy as he has very often known them in November. Perry does not call it altogether a sickly season. No, I do not know that Mr. Wingfield considers it very sickly except. Ah. My poor dear child, the truth is, that in London it is always a sickly. Season. Nobody is healthy in London, nobody can be. It is a dreadful thing to. Have you forced to live there? So far off. And the air so bad. No, indeed, we are not at all in a bad air. Our part of London is very superior to most others. You must not confound us with London in general. My dear sir, the neighbourhood of Brunswick Square is very different from almost all the rest. We are so very airy. I should be unwilling, I own, to live in any other part of the town, there is hardly any other that I could be satisfied to have my children in, but we are so remarkably airy. Mr. Wingfield thinks the vicinity of Brunswick Square decidedly the most favourable as to air. Ah, my dear, it is not like Hartfield. You make the best of it, but after you have been a week at Hartfield, you are all of you different creatures, you do not look like the same. Now I cannot say, 
that I think you are any of you. Looking well at present. I am sorry to hear you say so, sir, but I assure you, excepting those little nervous headaches and palpitations which I am never entirely free from. Anywhere, I am quite well myself, and if the children were rather pale before they went to bed, it was only because they were a little more tired than usual. From their journey and the happiness of coming, I hope you will think better of their looks tomorrow, for I assure you Mr. Wingfield told me that he did not believe he had ever sent us off altogether in such good case. I trust, at least, that you do not think Mr. Knightley looking ill turning her eyes with affectionate anxiety towards her husband. Milling, my dear, I cannot compliment you. I think Mr. John Knightley very far from looking well. What is the matter, sir? Did you speak to me? cried Mr. John Knightley, hearing his own name. I am sorry to find, my love, that my father does not think you looking. Well, but I hope it is only from being a little fatigued. I could have wished. However, as you know, that you had seen Mr. Wingfield before you left home. My dear Isabella, exclaimed he hastily, pray do not concern yourself about my looks. Be satisfied with doctoring and coddling yourself and the children, and let me look as I choose. I did not thoroughly understand what you were telling your brother cried. Emma, about your friend Mr. Graham's intending to have a bailiff from Scotland to look after his new estate. What will it answer? Will not the old prejudice be too strong? And she talked in this way so long and successfully that, when forced to give her attention again to her father and sister, she had nothing worse to hear than Isabella's kind inquiry after Jane Fairfax, and Jane Fairfax, though no great favourite with her in general, she was at that moment very happy to assist in praising that sweet, amiable Jane Fairfax, said Mrs John Knightley. It is so. Long since I have seen her, except now and then for a moment accidentally in town. What happiness it must be to her good old grandmother and excellent aunt, when she comes to visit them. I always regret excessively on dear Emma's account that she cannot be more at Highbury, but now their daughter is married, I suppose Colonel and Mrs Campbell will not be able to part with her at all. She would be such a delightful companion for Emma. Mr Woodhouse agreed to it all, but added, Our little friend Harriet Smith, however, is just such another pretty kind of young person. You will like Harriet. Emma could not have a better companion than Harriet. I am most happy to hear it, but only Jane Fairfax one knows to be so. Very accomplished and superior. And exactly Emma's age. This topic was discussed very happily, and others succeeded of similar moment, and passed away with similar harmony, but the evening did not close. Without a little return of agitation, the gruel came and supplied a great deal to be said, much praise and many comments, undoubting decision of its wholesomeness for every constitution, and pretty severe philippics upon the many houses where it was never met with tolerably, but, unfortunately, among the failures which the daughter had to instance, the most recent, and their foremost prominent, was in her own cook at South End, a young woman, hired for the time, who never had been able to understand what she meant by a basin of nice smooth gruel, thin, but not too thin, often as she had wished for, and ordered it, she had never been able to get anything tolerable. Here was a dangerous opening. Ah! said Mr. Woodhouse, shaking his head and fixing his eyes on her. With tender concern, Dot, 
the ejaculation in Emma's ear expressed, ah, there is no end of the sad consequences of your going to South End. It does not bear talking of. And for a little while she hoped he would not talk of it, and that her silent rumination might suffice to restore him to the relish of his own smooth gruel. After an interval of some minutes, however, he began with, I shall always be very sorry that you went to the sea this autumn, instead of coming here. But why should you be sorry, sir? I assure you, it did the children a great deal of good. And, moreover, if you must go to the sea, it had better not have been to South End. South End is an unhealthy place. Perry was surprised to hear you. Had fixed upon South End. I know there is such an idea with many people, but indeed it is quite a mistake, Sir Dot. We all had our health perfectly well there, never found the least inconvenience from the mud, and Mr. Wingfield says it is entirely a mistake to suppose the place unhealthy, and I am sure he may be depended on, for he thoroughly understands the nature of the air, and his own brother and family have been there repeatedly. You should have gone to Cromer, my dear, if you went anywhere. Dot, Perry was a week at Cromer once, and he holds it to be the best of all the sea bathing places. A fine open sea, he says, and very pure air. And, by what I understand, you might have had lodgings there quite away from the sea, a quarter of a mile off, very comfortable. You should have consulted Perry. But, my dear sir, the difference of the journey, only consider how great. It would have been dot, an hundred miles, perhaps, instead of forty. Ah. My dear, as Perry says, where health is at stake, nothing else should. Be considered, and if one is to travel, there is not much to choose between forty. Miles and an hundred dot, better not move at all, better stay in London altogether than travel 40 miles to get into a worse air. This is just what Perry said. It seemed to him a very ill-judged measure. Emma's attempts to stop her father had been vain, and when he had reached such a point as this, she could not wonder at her brother-in-law's breaking out. Mr. Perry said he, in a voice of very strong displeasure, would do as well to keep his opinion till it is asked for. Why does he make it any business of his to wonder at what I do? At my taking my family to one part of the coast or another. I may be allowed, I hope, the use of my judgment as well. As Mr. Perry Dot, I want his directions no more than his drugs. He paused and growing cool in a moment, added, with only sarcastic dryness, if Mr. Perry can tell me how to convey a wife and five children a distance of an hundred and thirty miles with no greater expense or inconvenience than a distance of forty, I should be as willing to prefer Cromer to South End as he could himself. True, true cried Mr. Knightley, with most ready interposition, very True. That's a consideration indeed, Dot, but John, as to what I was telling you of. My idea of moving the path to Langham, of turning it more to the right that it may not cut through the home meadows, I cannot conceive any difficulty. I should not attempt it, if it were to be the means of inconvenience to the Highbury people, but if you call to mind exactly the present line of the path. The only way of proving it, however, will be to turn to our maps. I shall see you at the Abbey tomorrow morning, I hope, and then we will look them over. And you shall give me your opinion. Mr. Woodhouse was rather agitated by such harsh reflections on his friend. Perry, to whom he had, in fact, though unconsciously, been attributing many of his own feelings and expressions, but the soothing attentions of his.
daughters gradually remove the present evil and the immediate alertness of one brother and better recollections of the other prevented any renewal of it. Chapter 13 There could hardly be a happier creature in the world than Mrs. John Knightley, in this short visit to Hartfield, going about every morning among her old acquaintance with her five children, and talking over what she had done every evening with her father and sister. She had nothing to wish otherwise, but that the days did not pass so swiftly. It was a delightful visit. Perfect, in being much too short. In general their evenings were less engaged with friends than their mornings, but one complete dinner engagement, and out of the house too. There was no avoiding, though at Christmas. Mr. Weston would take no denial. They must all dine at Randall's one day, even Mr. Woodhouse was persuaded. To think it a possible thing in preference to a division of the party. How they were all to be conveyed, he would have made a difficulty if he could, but as his son and daughter's carriage and horses were actually at Hartfield, he was not able to make more than a simple question on that head, it hardly amounted to a doubt, nor did it occupy Emma long to convince him that they might in one of the carriages find room for Harriet also. Harriet, Mr. Elton, and Mr. Knightley, their own especial set, were the only persons invited to meet them, the hours were to be early, as well as though. Numbers few, Mr. Woodhouse's habits and inclination being consulted in every thing. The evening before this great event, for it was a very great event that Mr. Woodhouse should dine out, on the 24th of December, had been spent by Harriet at Hartfield, and she had gone home so much indisposed with a cold that, but for her own earnest wish of being nursed by Mrs. Goddard, Emma could not have allowed her to leave the house. Emma called on her the next day, and found her doom already signed with regard to Randall's. She was very feverish and had a bad sore throat, Mrs. Goddard was full of care and affection, Mr. Perry was talked of, and Harriet herself was too ill and low to resist the authority which excluded her from this delightful engagement. Though she could not speak of her loss without many tears, Emma sat with her as long as she could, to attend her in Mrs. Goddard's unavoidable absences, and raise her spirits by representing how much Mr. Elton's would be depressed when he knew her state, and left her at last. Tolerably comfortable, in the sweet dependence of his having a most comfortless visit, and of their all missing her very much. She had not advanced many yards from Mrs. Goddard's door, when she was met by Mr. Elton himself, evidently coming towards it, and as they walked on slowly, together in conversation about the invalid, of whom he, on the room of considerable illness, had been going to inquire, that he might carry some report of her to Hartfield, they were overtaken by Mr. John Knightley. Returning from the daily visit to Donewall, with his two eldest boys, whose healthy, glowing faces showed all the benefit of a country run, and seemed to ensure a quick dispatch of the roast mutton and rice pudding they were hastening home for. They joined company and proceeded together. Emma was just describing the nature of her friend's complaint, a throat very much inflamed, with a great deal of heat about her, a quick, low pulse, see and she was sorry to find from Mrs. Goddard that Harriet was liable to very bad sore throats, and had often alarmed her with them. Mr. Elton looked all alarm on the occasion, as he exclaimed, a sore throat. I hope not infectious. I hope not of a putrid infectious sort. Has Perry seen her? Indeed you should take care of yourself as well as of your friend. Let me entreat you to run no risks. Why does not Perry see her? Emma, who was not really at all frightened herself, 
tranquilized this. Excessive apprehension by assurances of Mrs. Goddard's experience and care. But as there must still remain a degree of uneasiness which she could not wish to reason away, which she would rather feed and assist than not, she added. Soon afterwards, as if quite another subject. It is so cold, so very cold, and looks and feels so very much like snow that if it were to any other place or with any other party, I should really try not to go out today and dissuade my father from venturing, but as he has made up his mind and does not seem to feel the cold himself, I do not like to interfere, as I know it would be so great a disappointment to Mr. and Mrs. Weston. But, upon my word, Mr. Elton, in your case, I should certainly excuse myself. You appear to me a little hoarse already, and when you consider what demand of voice and what fatigues tomorrow will bring, I think it would be no more than common prudence to stay at home and take care of yourself too. Night. Mr. Elton looked as if he did not very well know what answer to make. Which was exactly the case, for though very much gratified by the kind care of such a fair lady, and not liking to resist any advice of hers, he had not really the least inclination to give up the visit, but Emma, too eager and busy in her own previous conceptions and views to hear him impartially, or see him with clear vision, was very well satisfied with his muttering acknowledgement of its being very cold, certainly very cold and walked on, rejoicing in having extricated him from Randall's, and secured him the power of sending to inquire. After Harriet every hour of the evening. You do quite right, said she, we will make your apologies to Mr. and Mrs. Weston. But hardly had she so spoken, when she found her brother was civilly offering a seat in his carriage, if the weather were Mr. Elton's only objection. And Mr. Elton actually accepting the offer with much prompt satisfaction. It was a done thing, Mr. Elton was to go, and never had his broad handsome face expressed more pleasure than at this moment, never had his smile been stronger, nor his eyes more exulting than when he next looked at her. Well said she to herself, this is most strange. After I had got him off so well, to choose to go into company and leave Harriet ill behind. Most strange indeed. But there is, I believe, in many men, especially single men, such an inclination, such a passion for dining out, a dinner engagement is so high in the class of their pleasures, their employments, their dignities, almost, their duties, that anything gives way to it, and this must be the case with Mr. Elton, a most valuable, amiable, pleasing young man undoubtedly, and very much in love with Harriet, but still, he cannot refuse an invitation, he must dine out wherever he is asked. What a strange thing love is. He can see ready. Wit in Harriet, but will not dine alone for her. Soon afterwards Mr. Elton quitted them, and she could not but do him though. Justice of feeling that there was a great deal of sentiment in his manner of naming Harriet at parting, in the tone of his voice while assuring her that he should call at Mrs. Goddard's for news of her fair friend, the last thing before. He prepared for the happiness of meeting her again, when he hoped to be able to give a better report, and he sighed and smiled himself off in a way that left the balance of approbation much in his favour. After a few minutes of entire silence between them, John Knightley began with I never in my life saw a man more intent on being agreeable than Mr. Elton. It is downright labour to him where ladies are concerned. With men he can be rational and unaffected, but when he has ladies to please, every feature works. Mr. Elton's manners are not perfect, replied Emma, but where there is a wish to please, one ought to overlook, and one does overlook a great deal.
Where a man does his best with only moderate powers, he will have the advantage over negligent superiority. There is such perfect good temper and good will in Mr. Elton as one cannot but value. Yes, said Mr. John Knightley presently, with some slyness, he seems to have a great deal of good will towards you. Me? She replied with a smile of astonishment, are you imagining me to be Mr. Elton's object? Such an imagination has crossed me, I own, Emma, and if it never occurred to you before, you may as well take it into consideration now. Mr. Elton in love with me. What an idea. I do not say it is so, but you will do well to consider whether it is so or not, and to regulate your behaviour accordingly. I think your manners to him. Encouraging. I speak as a friend, Emma. You had better look about you, and ascertain what you do, and what you mean to do. I thank you, but I assure you you are quite mistaken. Mr. Elton and I are very good friends, and nothing more, and she walked on, amusing herself in the consideration of the blunders which often arise from a partial knowledge of circumstances, of the mistakes which people of high pretensions to judgment are forever falling into, and not very well pleased with her brother, for imagining her blind and ignorant, and in want of counsel. He said no more. Mr. Woodhouse had so completely made up his mind to the visit, that in spite of the increasing coldness, he seemed to have no idea of shrinking from it, and set forward at last most punctually with his eldest daughter in his own carriage, with less apparent consciousness of the weather than either of the others, too full of the wonder of his own going, and the pleasure it was to afford at Randall's to see that it was cold, and too well wrapped up to feel it. Though cold, however, was severe, and by the time the second carriage was in motion, a few flakes of snow were finding their way down, and the sky had the appearance of being so overcharged as to want only a milder air to produce a very white world in a very short time. Emma soon saw that her companion was not in the happiest humour. Though, preparing and the going abroad in such weather, with the sacrifice of his children after dinner, were evils, were disagreeables at least, which Mr. John Knightley did not by any means like, he anticipated nothing in the visit that could be at all worth the purchase, and the whole of their drive to the vicarage was spent by him in expressing his discontent. A man said he must have a very good opinion of himself when he asks people to leave their own fireside and encounter such a day as this, for the sake of coming to see him. He must think himself a most agreeable fellow, I could not do such a thing. It is the greatest absurdity, actually snowing at this moment. The folly of not allowing people to be comfortable at home, and the folly of people's not staying comfortably at home when they can. If we were obliged to go out such an evening as this, by any call of duty or business, what a hardship we should deem it, and here are we, probably with rather thinner clothing than usual, setting forward voluntarily, without excuse, in defiance of the voice of nature, which tells man, in everything given to his view or his feelings, to stay at home himself, and keep all under shelter that he can, here are we setting forward to spend five dull hours in another man's house, with nothing to say or to hear that was not said and heard yesterday and may not be said and heard again tomorrow. Going in dismal weather, to return probably in worse, four horses and four servants taken out for nothing, but to convey five idle, shivering creatures into colder rooms and worse company than they might have had at home. Emma did not find herself equal to give the pleased assent, which no doubt. He was in the habit of receiving, to emulate the very true, my love which must have been usually administered by his travelling companion, 
but she had resolution enough to refrain from making any answer at all. She could not be complying, she dreaded being quarrelsome, her heroism reached only to silence. She allowed him to talk, and arranged the glasses, and wrapped herself up, without opening her lips. They arrived, the carriage turned, the step was let down, and Mr. Elton, spruce, black, and smiling, was with them instantly. Emma thought with pleasure of some change of subject. Mr. Elton was all obligation and cheerfulness, he was so very cheerful in his civilities indeed, that she began to think he must have received a different account of Harriet from what had reached her. She had sent while dressing, and the answer had been, much though. Same, not better. My report from Mrs. Goddard said she presently was not so pleasant. As I had hoped, not better was my answer. His face lengthened immediately, and his voice was the voice of sentiment. As he answered, Oh. No, I am grieved to find, I was on the point of telling you that when I called at Mrs. Goddard's door, which I did the very last thing before I returned to dress, I was told that Miss Smith was not better, by no means. Better, rather worse. Very much grieved and concerned, I had flattered myself that she must be better after such a cordial as I knew had been given her in the morning. Emma smiled and answered, my visit was of use to the nervous part of her complaint, I hope, but not even I can charm away a sore throat, it is a most severe cold indeed. Mr. Perry has been with her, as you probably heard. Yes, I imagined, that is, I did not. He has been used to her in these complaints, and I hope tomorrow morning will bring us both a more comfortable report. But it is impossible not to feel uneasiness. Such a sad loss to our party today. Dreadful. Exactly so, indeed. Dot, she will be missed every moment. This was very proper, the sigh which accompanied it was really estimable. But it should have lasted longer. Emma was rather in dismay when only half a minute afterwards he began to speak of other things, and in a voice of the greatest alacrity and enjoyment. What an excellent device, said he, the use of a sheepskin for carriages. How very comfortable they make it, impossible to feel cold with such precautions. The contrivances of modern days indeed have rendered a gentleman's carriage perfectly complete. One is so fenced and guarded from the weather that not a breath of air can find its way unpermitted. Weather becomes absolutely of no consequence. It is a very cold afternoon, but in this carriage we know nothing of the matter. Dot, ha. Snows a little, I see. Yes, said John Knightley, and I think we shall have a good deal of it. Christmas weather observed Mr. Elton. Quite seasonable, and extremely fortunate we may think ourselves that it did not begin yesterday and prevent this day's party, which it might very possibly have done, for Mr. Woodhouse would hardly have ventured had there been much snow on the ground, but now it is of no consequence. This is quite the season indeed for friendly meetings. At Christmas everybody invites their friends about them. And people think little of even the worst weather. I was snowed up at a friend's house once for a week. Nothing could be pleasanter. I went for only one night. And could not get away till that very day S.E. night. Mr. John Knightley looked as if he did not comprehend the pleasure, but said only, coolly, I cannot wish to be snowed up a week at Randall's. At another time Emma might have been amused, but she was too much. Astonished now at Mr. Elton's spirits for other feelings, Harriet seemed quite forgotten in the expectation of a pleasant party.
We are sure of excellent fires, continued he, and everything in the greatest comfort. Charming people, Mr. and Mrs. Weston, Mrs. Weston. Indeed is much beyond praise, and he is exactly what one values, so hospitable, and so fond of society, it will be a small party, but where small parties are select, they are perhaps the most agreeable of any. Mr. Weston's dining room does not accommodate more than ten comfortably, and for my part, I would rather, under such circumstances, fall short by two than exceed by two. I think you will agree with me, turning with a soft air to Emma, I think I shall certainly have your approbation, though Mr. Knightley perhaps, from being used to the large parties of London, may not quite enter into our feelings. I know nothing of the large parties of London, sir, I never dine with any body. Indeed. In a tone of wonder and pity, I had no idea that the law had been so great a slavery. Well, sir, the time must come when you will be paid for all this, when you will have little labour and great enjoyment. My first enjoyment replied John Knightley, as they passed through the sweep gate, will be to find myself safe at Hartfield again. Chapter 14 some change of countenance was necessary for each gentleman as they walked into Mrs. Weston's drawing room, Mr. Elton must compose his joyous looks, and Mr. John Knightley disperse his ill humour. Mr. Elton must smile less, and Mr. John Knightley more, to fit them for the place. Emma only might be as nature prompted, and show herself just as happy as she was. To her it was real enjoyment to be with the Westons. Mr. Weston was a great favourite, and there was not a creature in the world to whom she spoke with. Such unreserve, as to his wife, not any one, to whom she related with such conviction of being listened to and understood, of being always interesting and always intelligible, the little affairs, arrangements, perplexities, and pleasures of her father and herself. She could tell nothing of Hartfield, in which Mrs. Weston had not a lively concern, and half an hour's uninterrupted communication of all those little matters on which the daily happiness of private life depends, was one of the first gratifications of each. This was a pleasure which perhaps the whole day's visit might not afford, which certainly did not belong to the present half hour, but the very sight of Mrs. Weston, her smile, her touch, her voice was grateful to Emma, and she determined to think as little as possible of Mr. Elton's oddities, or of anything else unpleasant, and enjoy all that was enjoyable to the utmost. The misfortune of Harriet's cold had been pretty well gone through before her arrival. Mr. Woodhouse had been safely seated long enough to give the history of it, besides all the history of his own and Isabella's coming, and of Emma's being to follow, and had indeed just got to the end of his satisfaction. That James should come and see his daughter, when the others appeared, and... Mrs. Weston, who had been almost wholly engrossed by her attentions to him, was able to turn away and welcome her dear Emma. Emma's project of forgetting Mr. Elton for a while made her rather sorry to find, when they had all taken their places, that he was close to her. The difficulty was great of driving his strange insensibility towards Harriet, from her mind, while he not only sat at her elbow, but was continually obtruding his happy countenance on her notice, and solicitously addressing her upon every occasion. Instead of forgetting him, his behaviour was such that she could not avoid the internal suggestion of can it really be as my brother imagined? Can it be possible for this man to be beginning to transfer his affections from Harriet to me? Absurd and insufferable. 
yet he would be so anxious for her being perfectly warm, would be so interested about her father, and so delighted with Mrs. Weston, and at last would begin admiring her drawings. With so much zeal and so little knowledge as seemed terribly like a would-be lover, and made it some effort with her to preserve her good manners. For her own sake she could not be rude, and for Harriet's, in the hope that all would yet turn out right, she was even positively civil, but it was an effort, especially as something was going on amongst the others, in the most overpowering period of Mr. Elton's nonsense, which she particularly wished to listen to. She heard enough to know that Mr. Weston was giving some information about his son, she heard the words my son and Frank and my son repeated several times over, and, from a few other half-syllables very much suspected, that he was announcing an early visit from his son, but before she could quiet. Mr. Elton, the subject was so completely past that any reviving question from her would have been awkward. Now, it so happened that in spite of Emma's resolution of never marrying, there was something in the name, in the idea of Mr. Frank Churchill, which always interested her. She had frequently thought, especially since his father's marriage with Miss Taylor, that if she were to marry, he was the very person to suit her in age, character and condition. He seemed by this connection between the families quite to belong to her. She could not but suppose it to be a match that everybody who knew them must think of. That Mr. and Mrs. Weston did think of it, she was very strongly persuaded, and, though not meaning to be induced by him, or by anybody else, to give up her situation which she believed more replete with good than any she could change it for, she had a great curiosity to see him, a decided intention of finding him pleasant, of being liked by him to a certain degree, and a sort of pleasure in the idea of their being coupled in their friends' imaginations. With such sensations, Mr. Elton's civilities were dreadfully ill-timed, but she had the comfort of appearing very polite, while feeling very cross, and of thinking that the rest of the visit could not possibly pass without bringing forward the same information again, or the substance of it, from the open. Hearted Mr. Weston Dot, so it proved, for when happily released from Mr. Elton, and seated by Mr. Weston, at dinner, he made use of the very first interval in the cares of hospitality, the very first leisure from the saddle of mutton, to say to her, We want only two more to be just the right number. I should like to see two more here, your pretty little friend, Miss Smith, and my son, and then I should say we were quite complete. I believe you did not hear me telling though. Others in the drawing room that we are expecting Frank. I had a letter from him this morning, and he will be with us within a fortnight. Emma spoke with a very proper degree of pleasure, and fully assented to his proposition of Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Smith making their party. Quite complete. He has been wanting to come to us, continued Mr. Weston, ever since. September, every letter has been full of it, but he cannot command his own. Time. He has those to please who must be pleased, and who, between ourselves, are sometimes to be pleased only by a good many sacrifices. But. Now I have no doubt of seeing him here about the second week in January. What a very great pleasure it will be to you. And Mrs. Weston is so anxious to be acquainted with him that she must be almost as happy as yourself. Yes, she would be, but that she thinks there will be another put off. She does not depend upon his coming so much as I do, but she does not know the parties so well as I do. The case, you see, is, but this is quite between ourselves, I did not mention a syllable of it in the other room.
there are secrets. In all families, you know, the case is that a party of friends are invited to pay a visit at Inscum in January and that Frank's coming depends upon their being put off. If they are not put off, he cannot stir. But I know they will. Because it is a family that a certain lady, of some consequence, at Inscum, has a particular dislike to, and though it is thought necessary to invite them, once in two or three years, they always are put off when it comes to the point. I have not the smallest doubt of the issue. I am as confident of seeing Frank, here before the middle of January, as I am of being here myself, but you're good. Friend there, nodding towards the upper end of the table, has so few vagaries herself, and has been so little used to them at Hartfield, that she cannot calculate on their effects, as I have been long in the practice of doing. I am sorry there should be anything like doubt in the case, replied Emma, but am disposed to side with you, Mr. Weston. If you think he will come, I shall think so too, for you know in scum. Yes, I have some right to that knowledge, though I have never been at the place in my life. Dot, she is an odd woman. But I never allow myself to speak ill of her on Frank's account, for I do believe her to be very fond of him. I used to think she was not capable of being fond of anybody except herself. But she has always been kind to him, in her way, allowing for little whims and caprices, and expecting everything to be as she likes. And it is no small credit, in my opinion, to him, that he should excite such an affection, for, though I would not say it to anybody else, she has no more heart than a stone, to people in general, and the devil of a temper. Emma liked the subject so well, that she began upon it, to Mrs. Weston. Very soon after their moving into the drawing room, wishing her joy, yet observing that she knew the first meeting must be rather alarming. Dot, Mrs. Weston agreed to it, but added that she should be very glad to be secure of undergoing the anxiety of a first meeting at the time talked of, for I cannot depend upon his coming. I cannot be so sanguine as Mr. Weston. I am very much afraid that it will all end in nothing. Mr. Weston, I dare say, has been telling you exactly how the matter stands. Yes, it seems to depend upon nothing but the ill humour of Mrs. Churchill, which I imagine to be the most certain thing in the world. My Emma, replied Mrs. Weston, smiling, what is the certainty of Caprice. Then turning to Isabella, who had not been attending before, you must know, my dear Mrs. Knightley, that we are by no means so sure of seeing Mr. Frank Churchill, in my opinion, as his father thinks. It depends entirely upon his aunt's spirits and pleasure, in short, upon her temper. To you, to my Two daughters, I may venture on the truth. Mrs. Churchill rules at Inscum, and is a very odd-tempered woman, and his coming now depends upon her. Being willing to spare him. Oh, Mrs. Churchill, everybody knows Mrs. Churchill, replied Isabella. And I am sure I never think of that poor young man without the greatest compassion. To be constantly living with an ill-tempered person must be Dreadful. It is what we happily have never known anything of, but it must be a life of misery. What a blessing that she never had any children. Poor little creatures, how unhappy she would have made them. Emma wished she had been alone with Mrs. Weston. She should then have heard more, Mrs. Weston would speak to her with a degree of unreserve which she would not hazard with Isabella, and, she really believed, would scarcely try to conceal anything relative to the Churchills from her, excepting those views on the young man, of which her own imagination had already
given her such instinctive knowledge. But at present there was nothing more to be said. Mr. Woodhouse very soon followed them into the drawing room. To be sitting long after dinner was a confinement that he could not endure. Neither wine nor conversation was anything to him, and gladly did he move. To those with whom he was always comfortable. While he talked to Isabella, however, Emma found an opportunity of saying, And so you do not consider this visit from your son as by any means certain. I am sorry for it. The introduction must be unpleasant whenever it takes place, and the sooner it could be over, the better. Yes, and every delay makes one more apprehensive of other delays. Even if this family, the Braithwaites, are put off, I am still afraid that some excuse may be found for disappointing us. I cannot bear to imagine any reluctance on his side, but I am sure there is a great wish on the Churchills to keep him to themselves. There is jealousy. They are jealous even of his regard for his father. In short, I can feel no dependence on his coming, and I wish Mr. Weston were less sanguine. He ought to come, said Emma. If he could stay only a couple of days. He ought to come, and one can hardly conceive a young man's not having it in. His power to do as much as that. A young woman, if she fall into bad hands, may be teased, and kept at a distance from those she wants to be with, but one cannot comprehend a young man's being under such restraint as not to be able to spend a week with his father, if he likes it. One ought to be at Inscum and know the ways of the family before one decides upon what he can do, replied Mrs. Weston. One ought to use, though, same caution, perhaps, in judging of the conduct of any one individual of any one family, but in scum, I believe, certainly must not be judged by general rules, she is so very unreasonable, and everything gives way to her. But she is so fond of the nephew, he is so very great a favourite. Now, according to my idea of Mrs. Churchill, it would be most natural, that while she makes no sacrifice for the comfort of the husband, to whom she owes, Everything, while she exercises incessant caprice towards him, she should frequently be governed by the nephew, to whom she owes nothing at all. My dearest Emma, do not pretend, with your sweet temper, to understand a bad one, or to lay down rules for it, you must let it go its own way. I have no doubt of his having, at times, considerable influence, but it may be perfectly impossible for him to know beforehand when it will be. Emma listened, and then coolly said, I shall not be satisfied, unless he comes. He may have a great deal of influence on some points, continued Mrs. Weston, and on others, very little, and among those, on which she is beyond. His reach, it is but too likely, may be this very circumstance of his coming away from them to visit us. Chapter 15 Mr. Woodhouse was soon ready for his tea, and when he had drank his tea, he was quite ready to go home, and it was as much as his three companions could do to entertain away his notice of the lateness of the hour before the other gentlemen appeared. Mr. Weston was chatty and convivial, and no friend. To early separations of any sort, but at last the drawing-room party did receive an augmentation. Mr. Elton, in very good spirits, was one of the first to walk in. Mrs. Weston and Emma were sitting together on a sofa. He joined them immediately, and, with scarcely an invitation, seated himself between them. Emma, in good spirits too, from the amusement afforded her mind by the expectation of Mr. Frank Churchill, was willing to forget his late improprieties, and be as well satisfied with him as before, and on his making.
Harriet, his very first subject, was ready to listen with most friendly smiles. He professed himself extremely anxious about her fair friend, her fair, lovely, amiable friend. Did she know? Had she heard anything about her? Since their being at Randall's? He felt much anxiety, he must confess that though. Nature of her complaint alarmed him considerably. And in this style he talked. On for some time very properly, not much attending to any answer, but. Altogether sufficiently awake to the terror of a bad sore throat, and Emma was. Quite in charity with him. But at last there seemed a perverse turn, it seemed all at once as if he were. More afraid of its being a bad sore throat on her account, than on Harriet's. More anxious that she should escape the infection, than that there should be no. Infection in the complaint. He began with great earnestness to entreat her to. Refrain from visiting the sick chamber again, for the present, to entreat her to. Promise him not to venture into such hazard till he had seen Mr. Perry and learned his opinion, and though she tried to laugh it off and bring the subject back into its proper course, there was no putting an end to his extreme solicitude about her. She was vexed. It did appear, there was no concealing it. Exactly like the pretense of being in love with her, instead of Harriet, an inconstancy, if real, the most contemptible and abominable. And she had Difficulty in behaving with temper. He turned to Mrs. Weston to implore her. Assistance, would not she give him her support? Would not she add her? Persuasions to his, to induce Miss Woodhouse not to go to Mrs. Goddard's till. It was certain that Miss Smith's disorder had no infection. He could not be. Satisfied without a promise, would not she give him her influence in? Procuring it. So scrupulous for others he continued, and yet so careless for herself. She wanted me to nurse my cold by staying at home today, and yet will not. Promise to avoid the danger of catching an ulcerated sore throat herself. Is this fair, Mrs. Weston? Judge between us. Have not I some right to complain? I am sure of your kind support and aid. Emma saw Mrs. Weston's surprise, and felt that it must be great, at an address which, in words and manner, was assuming to himself the right of first interest in her, and as for herself, she was too much provoked and offended to have the power of directly saying anything to the purpose. She could only give him a look, but it was such a look as she thought must restore him to his senses, and then left the sofa, removing to a seat by her sister, and giving her all her attention. She had not time to know how Mr. Elton took the reproof, so rapidly did another subject succeed, for Mr. John Knightley now came into the room from examining the weather, and opened on them all with the information of the ground being covered with snow, and of it still snowing fast, with a strong Drifting wind, concluding with these words to Mr. Woodhouse. This will prove a spirited beginning of your winter engagements, sir. Something new for your coachman and horses to be making their way through. A storm of snow. Poor Mr. Woodhouse was silent from consternation, but everybody else. Had something to say, everybody was either surprised or not surprised, and had some question to ask, or some comfort to offer. Mrs. Weston and Emma tried earnestly to cheer him and turn his attention from his son-in-law, who was pursuing his triumph rather unfeelingly. I admired your resolution very much, sir, said he, in venturing out in such weather, for of course you saw there would be snow very soon. Every Body must have seen the snow coming on. I admired your spirit, and I dare say. We shall get home very well. Another hour or two snow can hardly make the road impassable, and we are two carriages, if one is blown over in the bleak.
Part of the common field there will be the other at hand. I dare say we shall be. All safe at Hartfield before midnight. Mr. Weston, with triumph of a different sort, was confessing that he had. Known it to be snowing some time, but had not said a word, lest it should. Make Mr. Woodhouse uncomfortable, and be an excuse for his hurrying away. As to there being any quantity of snow fallen or likely to fall to impede their return, that was a mere joke, he was afraid they would find no difficulty. He wished the road might be impassable, that he might be able to keep them all at Randall's, and with the utmost goodwill was sure that accommodation might be found for everybody, calling on his wife to agree with him, that with a little contrivance, everybody might be lodged, which she hardly knew how to do. From the consciousness of there being but two spare rooms in the house. What is to be done, my dear Emma? What is to be done? Was Mr. Woodhouse's first exclamation, and all that he could say for some time? To her. He looked for comfort, and her assurances of safety, her representation of the excellence of the horses, and of James, and of their having so many friends about them, revived him a little. His eldest daughter's alarm was equal to his own. The horror of being blocked up at Randall's, while her children were at Hartfield, was full in her imagination, and fancying the road to be now just passable for adventurous people, but in a state that admitted no delay, she was eager to have it settled. That her father and Emma should remain at Randall's, while she and her husband set forward instantly through all the possible accumulations of drifted snow that might impede them. You had better order the carriage directly, my love said she, I dare say. We shall be able to get along, if we set off directly, and if we do come to any thing very bad, I can get out and walk. I am not at all afraid. I should not mind. Walking half the way. I could change my shoes, you know, the moment I got home, and it is not the sort of thing that gives me cold. Indeed. Replied he. Then, my dear Isabella, it is the most extraordinary sort of thing in the world, for in general everything does give you cold. Walk. Home. You are prettily shod for walking home, I dare say. It will be bad. Enough for the horses. Isabella turned to Mrs. Weston for her approbation of the plan. Mrs. Weston could only approve. Isabella then went to Emma, but Emma could not. So entirely give up the hope of their being all able to get away, and they were. Still discussing the point, when Mr. Knightley, who had left the room, immediately after his brother's first report of the snow, came back again, and told them that he had been out of doors to examine, and could answer for their not being the smallest difficulty in their getting home, whenever they liked it. Either now or an hour hence. He had gone beyond the sweep, some way. Along the Highbury Road, the snow was nowhere above half an inch deep, in many places hardly enough to whiten the ground, a very few flakes were falling at present, but the clouds were parting, and there was every appearance of its being soon over. He had seen the coachman, and they both agreed with him in there being nothing to apprehend. To Isabella, the relief of such tidings was very great, and they were scarcely less acceptable to Emma on her father's account, who was immediately set as much at ease on the subject as his nervous constitution allowed, but the alarm that had been raised could not be appeased so as to admit of any comfort for him while he continued at Randall's. He was satisfied of there being no present danger in returning home, but no assurances could convince him that it was safe to stay, and while the others were variously urging and recommending, Mr. Knightley and Emma settled it in a few brief sentences, thus.
Your father will not be easy, why do not you go? I am ready, if the others are. Shall I ring the bell? Yes, do. And the bell was rung, and the carriages spoken for. A few minutes more. And Emma hoped to see one troublesome companion deposited in his own house, to get sober and cool, and the other recover his temper and happiness. When this visit of hardship were over, the carriage came, and Mr. Woodhouse, always the first object on such occasions, was carefully attended to his own by Mr. Knightley and Mr. Weston, but not all that either could say could prevent some renewal of alarm. At the sight of the snow which had actually fallen, and the discovery of a much darker night than he had been prepared for, he was afraid they should have a very bad drive. He was afraid poor Isabella would not like it. And there would be poor Emma in the carriage behind. He did not know what they had best do. They must keep as much together as they could, and James was talked to, and given a charge to go very slow and wait for the other carriage. Isabella stepped in after her father, John Knightley, forgetting that he did not belong to their party, stepped in after his wife very naturally, so that Emma found, on being escorted and followed into the second carriage by Mr. Elton, that the door was to be lawfully shut on them, and that they were to have a tete-a-tete -tete drive. It would not have been the awkwardness of a moment, it would have been rather a pleasure, previous to the suspicions of this very day. She could have talked to him of Harriet, and the three quarters of a mile would have seemed but one. But now, she would rather it had not happened. She believed he had been drinking too much of Mr. Weston's good wine, and felt sure that he would want to be talking nonsense. To restrain him as much as might be, by her own manners, she was immediately preparing to speak with exquisite calmness and gravity of the weather and the night, but scarcely had she begun, scarcely had they passed the sweep gate and joined the other carriage, than she found her subject cut up. Her hand seized, her attention demanded, and Mr. Elton actually making Violent love to her, availing himself of the precious opportunity, declaring sentiments which must be already well known, hoping, fearing, adoring, ready to die if she refused him, but flattering himself that his ardent attachment and unequalled love and unexampled passion could not fail of having some effect, and in short, very much resolved on being seriously accepted as soon as possible. It really was so. Without scruple, without apology, without much apparent diffidence, Mr. Elton, the lover of Harriet, was professing himself her lover. She tried to stop him, but vainly, he would go on and say it all. Angry as she was, the thought of the moment made her resolve to restrain herself when she did speak. She felt that half this folly must be drunkenness, and therefore could hope that it might belong only to the passing hour. Accordingly, with a mixture of the serious and the playful, which she hoped would best suit his half and half state, she replied, I am very much astonished, Mr. Elton. This to me. You forget yourself. You take me for my friend, any message to Miss Smith I shall be happy to deliver, but no more of this to me, if you please. Miss Smith. Message to Miss Smith. What could she possibly mean? And he repeated her words with such assurance of accent, such boastful pretense of amazement, that she could not help replying with quickness. Mr. Elton, this is the most extraordinary conduct. And I can account for it. Only in one way, you are not yourself, or you could not speak either to me, or of Harriet, in such a manner. Command yourself enough to say no more, and I will endeavour to forget it.
But Mr. Elton had only drunk wine enough to elevate his spirits, not at all. To confuse his intellects. He perfectly knew his own meaning, and having warmly protested against her suspicion as most injurious, and slightly touched upon his respect for Miss Smith as her friend, but acknowledging his wonder that Miss Smith should be mentioned at all, he resumed the subject of his own passion, and was very urgent for a favourable answer. As she thought less of his inebriety, she thought more of his inconstancy and presumption, and with fewer struggles for politeness, replied, It is impossible for me to doubt any longer. You have made yourself too clear. Mr. Elton, my astonishment is much beyond anything I can express. After such behaviour, as I have witnessed during the last month, to Miss Smith, such attentions as I have been in the daily habit of observing, to be addressing me in this manner, this is an unsteadiness of character, indeed, which I had not supposed possible. Believe me, sir, I am far, very far, from gratified in being the object of such professions. Good heaven! cried Mr. Elton, what can be the meaning of this? Miss Smith. I never thought of Miss Smith in the whole course of my existence. Never paid her any attentions, but as your friend, never cared whether she were dead or alive, but as your friend. If she has fancied otherwise, her own wishes have misled her, and I am very sorry, extremely sorry, but, Miss Smith. Indeed. Oh. Miss Woodhouse. Who can think of Miss Smith, when Miss Woodhouse is near? No, upon my honour, there is no unsteadiness of character. I have thought only of you. I protest against having paid the smallest attention to anyone else. Everything that I have said or done, for many weeks past, has been with the sole view of marking my adoration of yourself. You cannot really, seriously, doubt it. No in an accent meant to be insinuating. I am sure you have seen and understood me. It would be impossible to say what Emma felt, on hearing this, which of all her unpleasant sensations was uppermost. She was too completely overpowered to be immediately able to reply, and two moments of silence. Being ample encouragement for Mr. Elton's sanguine state of mind, he tried to Take her hand again, as he joyously exclaimed. Charming Miss Woodhouse. Allow me to interpret this interesting silence. It confesses that you have long understood me. No, sir, cried Emma, it confesses no such thing. So far from having long understood you, I have been in a most complete error with respect to your views, till this moment. As to myself, I am very sorry that you should have been giving way to any feelings, nothing could be farther from my wishes. Your attachment to my friend Harriet, your pursuit of her, pursuit, it, appeared, gave me great pleasure, and I have been very earnestly wishing you success, but had I supposed that she were not your attraction to Hartfield, I should certainly have thought you judged ill in making your visits so frequent. Am I to believe that you have never sought to recommend yourself, particularly to Miss Smith? That you have never thought seriously of her? Never, madam cried he, affronted in his turn, never, I assure you. I think seriously of Miss Smith. Miss Smith is a very good sort of girl, and I should be happy to see her respectably settled. I wish her extremely well, and... No doubt, there are men who might not object to, everybody has their level. But as for myself, I am not, I think, quite so much at a loss. I need not so totally despair of an equal alliance as to be addressing myself to Miss Smith.
No, madam, my visits to Hartfield have been for yourself only, and though. Encouragement I received. Encouragement? I give you encouragement. Sir, you have been. Entirely mistaken in supposing it. I have seen you only as the admirer of my. Friend. In no other light could you have been more to me than a common. Acquaintance. I am exceedingly sorry, but it is well that the mistake ends. Where it does. Had the same behaviour continued, Miss Smith might have. Been led into a misconception of your views, not being aware, probably, any. More than myself, of the very great inequality which you are so sensible of. But, as it is, the disappointment is single, and, I trust, will not be lasting. I have no thoughts of matrimony at present. He was too angry to say another word, her manner too decided to invite. Supplication, and in this state of swelling resentment, and mutually deep. Mortification, they had to continue together a few minutes longer, for the fears of Mr. Woodhouse had confined them to a foot pace. If there had not been so much anger, there would have been desperate awkwardness, but there. Straightforward emotions left no room for the little zigzags of embarrassment. Without knowing when the carriage turned into Vicarage Lane, or when it stopped, they found themselves, all at once, at the door of his house, and he was out before another syllable passed dot, Emma then felt it indispensable to wish him a good night. The compliment was just returned, coldly and proudly. And, under indescribable irritation of spirits, she was then conveyed to Hartfield. There she was welcomed, with the utmost delight, by her father, who had been trembling for the dangers of a solitary drive from Vicarage Lane turning a corner which he could never bear to think of, and in strange hands. A mere common coachman, no James, and there it seemed as if her return. Only were wanted to make everything go well, for Mr. John Knightley. Ashamed of his ill humour, was now all kindness and attention, and so. Particularly solicitous for the comfort of her father, as to seem, if not quite ready to join him in a basin of gruel, perfectly sensible of its being. Exceedingly wholesome, and the day was concluding in peace and comfort too. All their little party, except herself dot, but her mind had never been in such perturbation, and it needed a very strong effort to appear attentive and cheerful. Till the usual hour of separating allowed her the relief of quiet reflection. Chapter 16 the hair was curled, and the maid sent away, and Emma sat down to think. And be miserable, Dot, it was a wretched business indeed. Such an overthrow of everything she had been wishing for. Such a development of everything. Most unwelcome. Such a blow for Harriet. That was the worst of all. Every... Part of it brought pain and humiliation, of some sort or other, but, compared with the evil to Harriet, all was light, and she would gladly have submitted to feel yet more mistaken, more in error, more disgraced by misjudgment than she actually was, could the effects of her blunders have been confined to herself. If I had not persuaded Harriet into liking the man, I could have borne any thing. He might have doubled his presumption to me, but poor Harriet. How she could have been so deceived. He protested that he had never thought seriously of Harriet, never. She looked back as well as she could, but it was all confusion. She had taken up the idea, she supposed, and made every thing bend to it. His manners, however, must have been unmarked, wavering dubious, or she could not have been so misled. The picture. How eager he had been about the picture. And though. Sherard. And an hundred other circumstances, how clearly they had. Seemed to point at Harriet. To be sure, 
the charade, with its ready wit, but... Then the soft eyes, in fact it suited neither, it was a jumble without taste or... Truth. Who could have seen through such thick-headed nonsense? Certainly she had often, especially of late, thought his manners to herself. Unnecessarily gallant, but it had passed as his way, as a mere error of judgment, of knowledge, of taste, as one proof among others that he had not always lived in the best society, that with all the gentleness of his address, true elegance was sometimes wanting, but, till this very day, she had never, for an instant, suspected it to mean anything but grateful respect to her as Harriet's friend. To Mr. John Knightley was she indebted for her first idea on the subject for the first start of its possibility. There was no denying that those brothers had penetration. She remembered what Mr. Knightley had once said to her about Mr. Elton, the caution he had given, the conviction he had professed that Mr. Elton would never marry indiscreetly and blushed to think how much truer a knowledge of his character had been there soon than any she had reached herself. It was dreadfully mortifying, but Mr. Elton was proving himself, in many respects, the very reverse of what she had meant and believed him, proud, assuming, conceited, very full of his own claims, and little concerned about the feelings of others. Contrary to the usual course of things, Mr. Elton's wanting to pay his Addresses to her had sunk him in her opinion. His professions and his proposals did him no service. She thought nothing of his attachment and was insulted by his hopes. He wanted to marry well and having the arrogance to raise his eyes to her, pretended to be in love, but she was perfectly easy as to his not suffering any disappointment that need be cared for. There had been no real affection either in his language or manners. Sighs and fine words had been given in abundance, but she could hardly devise any set of expressions or fancy any tone of voice less allied with real love. She need not trouble herself to pity him. He only wanted to aggrandize and enrich himself, and if Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield the heiress of £30,000, were not quite so easily obtained as he had fancied, he would soon try for Miss Somebody, else with twenty, or with ten. But, that he should talk of encouragement, should consider her as aware of his views, accepting his attentions, meaning, in short, to marry him, should suppose himself her equal in connection or mind. Look down upon her friend, so well understanding the gradations of rank below him, and be so blind to what rose above, as to fancy himself showing no presumption in addressing her. It was most provoking. Perhaps it was not fair to expect him to feel how very much he was her inferior in talent, and all the elegances of mind. The very want of such Equality might prevent his perception of it, but he must know that in fortune and consequence she was greatly his superior. He must know that though Woodhouse's had been settled for several generations at Hartfield, the younger branch of a very ancient family, and that the Eltons were nobody. The landed property of Hartfield certainly was inconsiderable, being but a sort of notch in the Donewell Abbey estate, to which all the rest of Highbury belonged, but their fortune, from other sources, was such as to make them scarcely secondary to Donewell Abbey itself, in every other kind of consequence, and the Woodhouses had long held a high place in the consideration of the neighbourhood which Mr. Elton had first entered not two years ago, to make his way as he could, without any alliances but in trade, or anything to recommend him to notice but his situation and his civility. But he had fancied her in love with him, 
that evidently must have been his dependence. And after raving a little about the seeming incongruity of gentle manners and a oh, conceited head, Emma was obliged in common honesty to stop and admit that her own behaviour to him had been so complacent and obliging, so full of courtesy and attention, as, supposing her real motive unperceived, might warrant a man of ordinary observation and delicacy, like Mr. Elton, in fancying himself a very decided favourite. If she had so misinterpreted his feelings, she had little right to wonder that he, with self-interest to blind him, should have mistaken hers. The first error and the worst lay at her door. It was foolish, it 